of you, Marcellus, Ellison. I'm delighted to have a young man who is multi-talented, and he is a photojournalist as well as an entrepreneur, and he's done some acting as well. So we'll see about that. We're glad to welcome El Casimu Harris. All right. Thank you for having me. Yes, very delighted that you could join us now. Let's talk about this acting and this, you know, modeling thing that you have going. Come on now. It's What's been, the deal? It's been quite interesting. I started acting a little bit uh, as about a 13-year-old. I was in a play with Chikula Chajua called Lotto. Okay. Uh, so that, that was the first thing. And since then, it's been because of my writing. I briefly worked for Chime as a writer's department intern, and then I had a uh, uh, interim clearance coordinator position with Chime as well. Mm -hmm. And there I got a chance to meet a lot of people uh, who were casting agents. So sometimes when uh, I guess people didn't show up, they, uh, they'll call me at the last minute, you, you want to be in a video or you want to be <laughs> an actor in a movie? And I okay. always say yes. Okay. Now when you're a writing intern, that, now how does that work? Well, I thought that I got to actually edit script. Uh, at first I thought that I would just get coffee. It wasn't that. I actually got to work with script. You got and tea and... I thought I would. I thought I would. <laughs> I thought it would be mere grunt work. But uh, they actually gave you script. I was working with David Simon, Lola Sarek, Eli, and all these great people. And they would give you the script and you got to read it. So one day I decided to start changing the dialogue. I thought that someone should say this. I thought that someone should say that. And it was like, no, no, sir. That's not quite your job. Mm -hmm. But I did catch a spelling error, and I'm a horrible speller. Protracted mm -hmm. was the uh, incorrect word that I caught. So it Protracted? was Protracted? Protracted, yeah. Carol T A C T E D? In, indeed. I, I <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I knew it when it I, counted. I, I think I often make myself, so <laughs> I've been working on that one. So now, what, what, what exactly was the intern for? So you were interning for the actual writers? Exactly. I was in a writer's department, and uh, uh, my job was to, uh, they, because they came from journalism, David Simon worked for the Baltimore Sun. He was about truth-telling. So there was a one scene where Gigi's bar burned down. One of my jobs was to find out the protocol of who would you call first, uh, insurance and things like that. Uh, for the next season, I, I worked in a, the set dressing department, so the interim mm -hmm. clearance coordinator. And on the opening scene where you saw the signs, uh, precinct this, wore that, I actually had to do research to, to make it authentic. So if they were voting in Lakeview, I had to have that actual uh, ward and precinct correct. And the funny thing was, the city didn't really know. So it was... Uh, <laughs> imagine I was, that. Imagine that. So <laughs> I had to really work. And you're working really hard to something that may only be on screen for a second, but it's all about that truth telling that David Simon really uh, embodied. So, now, what's your opinion about you know? Yeah, okay, the truth telling, but in, in some of these, you know, you have a main character who is fictional. So, Indeed. How, how much truth is there? You know, what is the actual quest for the truth? Well, I think all fiction is based off some level of truth. Just like I think it's always seriousness and jest. So, even if it's fictitious, you don't want to be inauthentic, much like seeing a trombone player and he's playing one note and it slides all wrong and yeah, for instance one thing I can definitely articulate when you see a drummer playing with sticks but you hear brushes, it's just you know, he's not a real drummer but you know that really is impossible to happen. Mm -hmm. Alright, so now uh I believe you went to the New Orleans Center of Creative Arts. I did. You did, right? Okay. <laughs> what was that like? Let's talk about that training. <laughs> well, that helped me to what I do today. I went, I studied with Clyde Kerr. It was on Perrier Street, mm -hmm. and I studied jazz performance. And at the time, I had no idea that I would ever pursue writing or I would ever pursue photojournalism. And the way I said it helped me directly to what I do now is at the time, I would look to my left, I would look to my right, and I would always think that this person could do this, Irving could do this, or you know, Andre uh, Bayham could do this, Big Sam could do this. And sometimes you would feel uh, inferior or you would just wonder why you couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And once I went to graduate school, I got put out in Oakland uh, the second half of my senior year. So I didn't, I didn't actually finish. So hopefully I become really famous. Why were you actually put out? Yeah, I, I don't even remember it. Uh, <laughs> I would tell you the okay. truth. Well, selective I, memory. Okay, that's no. cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't remember. Uh, 
I remember Mr. Kerr saying he, he thought I was trying to be famous. And I was like, uh, I don't think anybody who's pursuing jazz is really trying to be famous mm. uh, as an 18-year-old. I mean, you would want to do rap. But mm. failing out of NOCA or getting put out, out of NOCA, when I went to graduate school, it gave me uh, the knowledge that I didn't have to look at my peer to my left or my peer to my right and worry about their ability now that their ability now may be at the best that they would ever become. That They may be at that pinnacle of writing. Mm -hmm. And it just helped me to stay focused and just continue pursuing uh, getting better as a writer and eventually as a photographer. So I didn't really put the pressure on myself of this person read that many books or they've done this and I hadn't done that yet. But the experience at NOCA helped me, you know, 15 years later in life. Mm -hmm. And now you play trumpet. So, you know, what's that like? What's your opinion about the, like, the trumpet's role in the band? And, we, you know, how did you feel when you were playing trumpet in the band? I loved it. I loved it. Uh, you, you're definitely the lead instrument. Uh, you could play louder than anyone. And mm -hmm. uh, you played the melody. And it was just a powerful instrument. I mean, Gabriel played the trumpet. So, so they say. I uh, think he actually might have played the trombone. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it, it was it was a powerful instrument, and uh, at the end of the night, you just put your trumpet in your bag and leave instead of like packing up drums or having having to carry around the bass. Mm -hmm. So that ability to lead a band, uh, that's the one thing I loved about the trumpet. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so now you mentioned your when you got your master's degree, where did you go for undergraduate? I went to Middle Tennessee State University mm -hmm. in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, okay. and initially. I went to study uh, music business, and uh, I was in the studios and hanging out with the musicians, and it was really fun then, but when I went to school to study it, it just was a little bit different, and I decided that that wasn't something I wanted to pursue hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. So what was it like in the country, Murfreesboro? <laughs> What's happening over there? Well, uh, don't order. A, hamburger dressed or anything like that they're gonna look at you funny but really? oh, what do you yeah. have to say <laughs> it's just don't know what you're talking about I mean it was definitely an adjustment coming from New Orleans is a big city compared to that so I had a lot of different life experiences than my peers and uh, I just had to they move differently than I did it's, it's nothing to be in New Orleans and to see a Wynn Marcellus or to see a, a John Goodwin or you know anyone who would just partaking in the culture of New Orleans and really? my parents, my, my peers <laughs> okay. who come from these small towns, uh -huh. they just, I, I would tell them stories of some of my experiences and they, they just did not believe me ever, mm. which was funny. Uh, and then it would turn my stories around on me. I didn't, I didn't like that. So I just stopped telling stories. So now you think that experience prepared you a little more for your professional life or NOCA or was it kind of equal? I think NOCA did. I think NOCA did because you were around people who were pursuing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it was more of an encouraging thing. Uh, once I got to Tennessee, I found that you had to hold on harder to being true to yourself because I was around so many people unlike me. And, you know, just to, to test who you are. And if you want to, you know, if you, if you want to wear some seersucker pants and people say you look like a railroad conductor, uh, you wear your sister sucker pants or you conform to what they thought was hip, but mm -hmm. you know, so it it helped me strengthen who I was as a person. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now uh, the photojournalism, so when did you begin taking pictures? How'd that come about? After Hurricane Katrina, I already I went to Ole Miss for graduate school, so 2005, mm -hmm. and I was studying under a guy, uh, Dr. Michael Cheers. Wait, Ole Miss? Oh, Ole I'm Miss. Sorry. We got to go back. <laughs> what was that like? Ole Miss? Like I, Mississippi burning and all of that kind yeah, of? Yeah, I didn't experience that. I, I actually loved it. I, I loved it. It was one or two times that something happened and it gave me pause. Uh, but only once or twice. Only once or twice, and mm -hmm. I could, I could. What was that? Uh, once I went to this place called maybe Handy Andy's to get a hamburger, and I, I love hamburgers. And it was a little bit off the beaten path. They still smoke there, and you walk in, and it was a bunch of uh, guys who weren't as refined as, as I guess you would say. They lived in a the country, mm -hmm. and uh, 
I got my hamburger. I wasn't paying attention. I was with a, a, a guy, a, a, a white guy from like Virginia or something like that. And we sat down and we we're eating the hamburgers and he just apologized. He looked at me, he was like, I'm sorry, man, I'm sorry. Cause he could feel everybody looking at me. It looked like they had threw the hamburger down. Like you just ruined my meal, boy. <laughs> So I never went back there. Why you gonna ruin the people's meal? Man? I just was trying to get a good hamburger. Come on, man, how That's you gonna act? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted a good hamburger. And when I got there, they had already stopped uh, waving the Confederate flag officially. Mm -hmm. But you, you would still see it sometimes at tailgates and things like that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people would, you know, look at you and say things like, "Well, it's not what you think, or it's this, or it's that." And uh, we even had a, a rebel, uh, Colonel Reb, which was obviously an ode to the, uh, the, the Army, the Confederate Army. Mm -hmm. And just recently, some people who I'm friends with from Ole Miss, uh, once they changed the Confederate rebel, they, uh, they got sad. And, um, you know, I didn't want to come at them with a racist kind of thing, like, oh, you shouldn't like it because of this, or you shouldn't like it because of that. I just explained to them about change. I talked to them with things that they would understand. I was like, I remember when the Saints drafted Deuce McAllister, me growing up a Ricky Williams fan, I was really hurt. But in the long run, the change was much better. I didn't like when k &B sold out and it became Rite Aid. I wanted to keep who it was. And, and I told them how I didn't grow up an old Miss Rebel like they did. You know, I didn't have this guy my whole life and he was just an endearing cartoon mm -hmm. but don't let our past hold us back from a greater future mm -hmm. by changing this stop offending people and maybe you can stop complaining about not getting good recruits and having a bad football season each year so from that angle mm -hmm. I think they understood it so now you know there are some who believe that there is at risk the possibility that a lot of the history from the 1800s and 1700s will be lost because now everything is so politically correct. One thing being the Confederate flag. So now that if the Confederate flag no longer exists, there's no real reason to have conversation about what went on. Right. So what's your take from that standpoint of view? It's a, that's a great question. I'm, I'm, I'm torn in a sense, and I, I mentioned that too. I, I don't have any allegiance to the Confederate flag, and it, it was a but I don't think you should tear down these Confederate statues uh, of Robert E. Lee or uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest. It, it existed. It happened. Mm -hmm. This is something that has stood the test of time for 200 years, and it is what it is. Uh, so on one hand, I feel that way, but the Confederate flag, I'm like, you know, what's the, what's the point of that now? And I've tried to talk to some people and hear their point about it, and most people can't really articulate it. Uh, but my friend, again, he, he got a Ph.D. from Ole Miss in history. His thing was uh, don't approach people who are proponents of the Confederate flag with racism. Approach them with uh, being patriotic, that the South were terrorists against the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So if you really a patriot, uh, they went against America. Mm -hmm. So, Well, so, and you're imagining that people are, are thinking about it on that kind of a level, that they're being unpatriotic? Uh, not that they're being unpatriotic, but what the Confederacy did was unpatriotic. They were they were terrorists. If if you go against the American government, mm -hmm. you're a terrorist. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. in that in that regard, mm -hmm. that's a hell of a dichotomy. Indeed. When you think about how folks consider terrorism to be another whole, you know, kind of an issue. So right. let's talk a little bit now. I believe you just had a photo exhibit. I did. I had my first solo exhibit, which. Part of it is still up at Balak at 936 St. Charles Avenue. It was about dreams do come true. And I had 10 photos in that, uh, some of them professional pursuits, some of them pursuits of others, and saintly dreams. Uh, I grew up thinking that it was a better chance of the Saints winning the Super Bowl than ever having a black president. So I explored that visually. And that exhibit is mostly still up and I recently participated in a group exhibition Freedom Through the Lens with two other photographers and this was at Delgado Fine Art Gallery mm -hmm. and uh, Maisha Francis curated it and it was with uh, Gus Bennett Jr. and Jafar M. Pierre and it was just a beautiful experience to share your work with other photographers 
and just them to be so communal. Uh, I'm not always used to that with photographers. They could be some insular people at times, but coming to New Orleans and meeting other people and just sharing is, is a really gratifying experience. Mm -hmm. We may have some of your photos. We may not. We're going to just see in a second what happens. See, Cavs going to tell us. Oh, there we go. All right, now, tell us a little bit about this one here. This one is licensed to HBO Treme, so it was in the uh, the fourth and final season, the opening credits of Treme, and this uh, really was a catalyst for the exhibit. It's called Dreams Do Come True. I took this in 2009 on Louisiana Avenue, and this was a perfect gentleman social aid and pleasure club, and their theme was Dreams Do Come True. This, okay, this? this is, uh, I call it Spy Boy. This is from St. Joseph night maybe 2011 and just the intensity of his eyes just really did something to me and I, I actually one day want to sew and mask Indian mm. uh, this uh, brothers playing chess outside in the seven war uh -huh. and uh, I just appreciated that you may look at these people away from the chess board and may not think that they play chess but these brothers was, was really dealing it mm -hmm. and not even talking they were just playing Look like he got a faulty move, man. I might be able to take him on that one. Now, what's, what's happening here? This is Black Men of Labor. Uh, this is one of their second lines. And uh, this was towards the end. We were on St. Claude Avenue. And uh, I just appreciated the way the sun was setting. And this actually was the closing piece for my exhibit. And uh, I just want to be able to document New Orleans and really become great at that. And, you know, mm -hmm. you when you do something you love. Now, is there a difference between well, maybe what you're trying to accomplish and, oh, okay, let's talk about this one first. And then, what is this? This is Don't Just Dream It. I shot this with this, uh, the Wildlife Reserve, and we wanted to really showcase uh, young black guys in a, in a positive light. So we took this at an RCA bus stop on uh, Canal Street, and uh, this is, I guess, the first piece that I've ever sold, and it's been uh, it's been doing well for me. Now, did you set so you set this up. You I did. I, I did. did. I did. To, okay. Right. Right. But we it's just. <laughs> okay. This this is when I uh, the first time I ever tried to shoot a, a album cover. So this is with a guy who looks pretty familiar sitting to my left and mm -hmm. his his father. This is at the Joan Mitchell Center, mm -hmm. and uh, it's for uh, we want to really capture the theme of being a Southern gentleman. Mm -hmm. and have elegance in a southern setting. So that's what I was trying to achieve here. And I just like the, the interplay with you and your father. That's a bad song. Yes, that. indeed. Yeah. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> okay, so, uh, but in general, I was asking the question of you know, what is it that you, are, how do you adjust in the different settings? Or what is it that you actually try to accomplish when you're taking still shots? Great question. Sometimes with the, the case of the gentleman playing, chess. I was driving, I saw it, and I had been thinking about uh, people in New Orleans playing chess outside all the time. We do a lot in New Orleans outside. So I pulled my car over, told myself I was not going to pass the shot up. I had to go, introduce myself, let them know what I was doing, and hopefully they felt comfortable around me. And, and they did. They allowed me to come into their world and take the picture. So, so things like that, you, you approach it differently. Uh, some other shots that I've taken, I, I've thought about it beforehand, scouted the location, and you get there beforehand and set up the lights and set up whatever props you have. But it, it all starts from a vision, whether it's a spontaneous shot like I did with the guys playing chess or a shot like I did with yourself where I knew in advance that I was going to do it. It all starts with a vision in my mind. And from that, I tried to bring it to life. Mm -hmm. And now on the exhibit, so these are some of the shots that were in, in the exhibit, and yes, what are sir. some of the other shots maybe that you had on exhibit? Uh, I had a, a, another one uh, uh, that featured two football players, Jabari Greer, mm -hmm. and that one was, uh, we call that When Music Calls. He hosted a show on, a jazz show on WWOZ, so uh, we have him holding uh, uh, Bill Evans' album cover, and he's in Olivier's, and eating, real New Orleans looking kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that was that. And I did one with Malcolm Jenkins. Uh, outside of football, he has a bow tie line, Rock Ave bow ties. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And uh, I did one with him all tied up. And he's in O.L. Just Point Bar. And behind him, you can see an American flag and all kind of graffiti. And he has on a floral shirt. And he's just really looking into the camera, unflinching. 
And before I took that, I really thought about um, Gordon Parks, the, the photo he has with the troll woman called American Gothic. And she's just looking directly into the camera. And uh, I think that I had the American flag in there because, you know, we the American dream means so much to so many different people. And I thought it was a piece that would provoke you and cause you to think, which it has, and draw your own interpretations. Mm. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about things that you have coming up in the future. What do you have lined up? Uh, writing, 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 and more photography. Mm. Uh, I'm taking ownership in my own story and telling it in different ways. I like to write coming-of-age stories. Uh, one story I wrote is about a time uh, you taught me how to talk to girls for the first time. All right, all right. <laughs> I, won't, I won't tell that whole story. That, that was a good day. <laughs> oh, that's silly. All yeah, right. So is it like told from the third person, or are you like right there on the time? You know, how yeah, did, No, how it's, I'm, I'm in a moment because I remember it. <laughs> that's pretty silly. Perfectly. Uh, yeah. Just the dialogue and uh, things like that, just things that help help you develop as a man and various experiences I have. Uh, I've also started writing for this magazine called, or website called The Pelican Bomb, and I like to write about art. And I like to really embed myself with the subject and, and get to know them and uh, try to really tell a story from that point of view, opposed to a quick hitter. Mm -hmm. In photography, I, I'm next week I'm going to Philander Smith College in Little Rock, Arkansas, to do an exhibit with a friend, Vita Shell. And uh, going to give a lecture, so I'm really looking forward to that. This is the first time I'm doing something like that, and uh, just always trying to do more. I, I do a lot of stuff with style. I have uh, something called Paris Chic mm -hmm. that I initially started with Oxford American, and from that I was telling stories about style and taking the pictures of style. I'm going to relaunch it independently, and it's still telling stories about style. Uh, but it's more voices than my own. Mm -hmm. And that's the project that I'm really looking forward to because I think you see a lot of great fashion photography. You see style writing, but you don't always see them married together. And we're not really talking about like the, it's just stories like for you, for instance, for most of your life, you didn't wear jeans. And I want to know that moment when you decided to start wearing jeans. I want to know that moment maybe in Ben Franklin when, uh, style became important to you so I'm that's where that is going and uh, style is just the umbrella to tell a story hmm. so hmm. it's just always trying to do something and now your own style is it a combination of maybe G GQ brothers on the corner I mean you know, what, are you, <laughs> what are you trying to get to on a general basis uh, you know I think it's like music for me it's improvisation within a structure you know I have a certain set of changes, a certain set of rules that I don't necessarily break. I'm not going to wear more than three buttons, but I will wear a pattern against a pattern. Uh, I'm not going to wear linen and wool, but you know I will wear a blazer and shorts. So I like to call it profane and profound. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where my style derives from. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about the? So you said you won't wear more than three buttons. You mean on a jacket? On a blazer. Yeah. Okay. On a blazer. Why is that? I just. I, that's just not my thing, you know, just the old, Steve Harvey doesn't dress like that anymore, but you used to see the 20 button Steve Harvey suits, mm -hmm. uh, square toe shoes, uh, jackets too long. That's not that anything is wrong with that, it's just not what I choose to do. And what about the color coordination? Um, I love colors, I like to push it, I like bold. Um, I don't mind about that. I, I love colors, it's just the more color the better, but still within a certain strict rule of changes, you know, I'm not going to play a 12 bar blues and, you know, take nine, you know, it's just not what I'm going to do. But I mean like this outfit here, would you wear like a pink bow tie with that or maybe an orange bow tie or yellow? Where does it stop? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> I, I would have to see how it looks. I, you know, uh, I think you try it, and then if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I like what uh, I think. I heard a musician say one time that he didn't always like Benny Goodman's band because Benny Goodman's band played perfect all the time. Mm -hmm. I think Audie Shaw said this about Benny Goodman's band. Oh, he love us. Right. That's it. We're out of time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's it. That's going to do it. I'm Delphio Marcellus. We're going to thank El Casimo Harris for coming, and we'll catch you later. All right. Yeah.
next time. Yeah.